Hey, Chrissy, I don't know if I believe this, but Riley and I have found out that apparently, that's right, Riley, apparently dogs have a keen awareness of holiday routines from the smell of seasonal treats to the sound of wrapping gifts. They often pick up on these unique holiday cues, sometimes even reacting with excitement to decorations or festive music. I do know that my cats love the decorations on the Christmas tree. So maybe I'm that's sure what they, they pick do. up on. <laughs> I'm sure they do because to them, that's Christmas all around. Oh, yeah. Well, guys, we're here in the holiday mode today. So welcome to the Dog Moms. Dog Moms, Dog Moms, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Dog Moms. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our special holiday episode of the Dog Moms podcast. I'm Amber here, and I also have baby Riley as well. And of course, we're joined by the amazing Chrissy Joy. I love that Riley's here today. And listeners, it's that time of year again, full of joy, laughter, and of course, our wonderful furry friends who make the season even brighter. Absolutely, Chrissy. The holidays are such a magical time, not just for us, but for our dogs and cats too. I, I didn't say anything, I promise. They really do pick up on the excitement and let's be honest, probably all the extra holiday treats as well. Oh my gosh, yes, definitely the treats. I actually get these little kits that are like the gingerbread houses for dogs. I get them every year from Petco or PetSmart. But we have so much more. Let's not forget, we have the festive walks and adorable holiday themed dog outfits. We've all done it and we all do it. It's a season full of wagging tails and heart warming moments. But before we talk a little bit about some of the great practices to spend the holidays with our dogs, I'd like to tell everybody that on today's show, we're going to be talking to Dr. Courtney Campbell, who is a wonderful surgeon, veterinarian. Yes, that's right, Riley. And we're going to speak to him about the canine respiratory virus that's going around that everyone's talking about. So hopefully we'll be getting some great info from Courtney, who's also going to answer some of the questions that you guys have asked us. Yes, and you can always ask us anything and follow the show at dogtv.com forward slash the dog moms. We will try our best to answer all of your questions on the show. And if we can't, I'm sure Riley will. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) But before we talk to Courtney, Chrissy, I want to talk about holidays with our pets, some of the things that we do. But I also know that we're very protective of our dogs and our pets during the holidays. So maybe let's chat about some of the ways that we keep our pets safe during the holidays, but also how we enjoy the holidays with our pets too. I think that's like the perfect way to start this conversation is that you brought up that your cats love the tree and the decorations. And that's one thing that I notice immediately is that that is such an attractant to all sorts of like, even the old, like they make these little dog treat like ornaments, but you have to remember like it's full of glue and glitter, but I'm like, that's still a dog treat. And so my dogs are like investigating it. And I don't know. It's, it's always not only the dog treat, but like, it kind of looks like you're putting toys on the, on the Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially if you have cats, but dogs too, you're putting things like tinsel and garland and all those things can be pretty enticing to your pets. It's true. And also if you have like an actual real tree, like that can also be attractant to your pet to use the bathroom. And so there's other things if you have... (laughs) I, no, I'm not even kidding you. I have, no, I've I've had that happen yeah. to me before. <laughs> yes, I have intact male dogs and they, it's a tree. So yep. for them, they're like, well, what is this? This is nice in the house. How convenient. And I'm like, this is yeah. not where you're supposed to go. I remember Oakley's first Christmas with me. He wasn't my dog yet. I was just fostering him. And I brought him into the house to kind of take him for home for the holidays to like, you know, he was he was a shelter dog. And the second he came into our house, he peed on the Christmas tree. Oh and I was gosh. like, this poor dog probably thinks, wow, thank you for bringing a toilet inside for me. You know, so that's something that actually boy. happens. It's so hard to think that he would do that. It's so hard to think of like untrained Oakley. He always seems right? like he's just been so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also the thought of like having a lot of guests come over and mm. the day of Christmas. I wanted to pick your brain on this. So real quick, cause I know we have so much to go for in this episode, but when it's Christmas day, right? Do you just immediately involve all your pets with the unwrapping and the people, or do you choose a time to bring them into the room? What do you do? You know, that's a really good question. So my dogs always spend Christmas with us if they can. Um, We'd bring the cat sometimes too if we're traveling. Um, But I do have like specific presents that I wrap for them. And I let them open their presents first before everyone else's presents. And I find that that really helps them not like be involved with everything else. Um, Because if they get to unwrap a present and they have a new toy, while everyone's opening their presents, they're kind of focused on their new toy that they got. Now, I'm not saying everyone wraps their 
their dog's presents for them. But that's something that I like to do because it gives them like a fun little enrichment thing to do before we start the day. And then they have a new toy to play with and occupy themselves while they're unwrapping. Do, do they you get have a stocking? Do they get a stocking they, as well? They have stockings, but I wrap their presents and put it inside of the stocking. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So, Which is yeah, like, I mean, it's like a puzzle toy, honestly. It is. Yeah. It is. And then they have fun and I have a little bit of mess to clean up. But of course, if your dog like is likely to eat or swallow wrapping paper, mm-hmm. you might want to think twice. But I think do you have something that you thing. do? Yeah, my dogs love the wrapping paper almost more than the toys sometimes. I think so, so yeah. <laughs> I know. So actually what happens is, is we have like the room mapped out where like the family sits in the room, but then the dogs are with us, but they're just like kind of behind us in this like other cove area. Mm. And honestly, what they wait for is the wrapping paper to be thrown to them. Yeah. So and as they we shred unwrap, it. <laughs> we like ball it up and we chuck it to them. And then thank God, like I, I'm very lucky that none of them ingest it, but they all want right. to shred it. So it just ends up being like this hilarious like like, you know, like, yeah. the chain of command, like process. Like I'm it's doing cute because it's like the dogs have their own Christmas tradition as yeah. well. But, um, you know, talking about dogs swallowing things and stuff, it made me think about some of the things, not only ornaments and decorations, but did you know that poinsettias are actually like really dangerous for pets, especially cats? Wow. So a lot of times when we get these new holiday things in our house, Riley has a very strong feeling about that. <laughs> That's right. Um, but it's sad because I've had people give them to me as presents before. Like, here's this beautiful plant in your house. And I always like leave it outside or somewhere that my pets can't access it because those types of plants are actually poisonous to cats. And I think they're wow. poisonous for dogs too. So those yeah. are the kind of things that like we have to be aware of ahead of time because mm-hmm. we don't want any accidents to happen like on Christmas Day. It's so true. And everyone wants to like, you know, have the candles out and all the other things around the home to make it smell good. But I just bought like an electric water warmer for my wax melts and stuff. But like still that's hot wax sitting in something. So you have to be careful about all of these festivities and including the food that you're baking and putting out that you're going to just be really aware about where your dogs are and how well trained they are. And if you need to add some gates to your Christmas list. (laughs) Right. I know we have a gates set up this year and I think it's going to make opening presents a little bit more less chaotic too, but I'm glad that the dogs get their own presents as well. But I'm really excited for the holidays to come up. And honestly, like I'm, you're the curious to hear like what our listeners do with their pets for the holidays. Mm -hmm. So if you guys are listening to this and you want to share any special Christmas routines you have with your dogs or your cats too. Send um, us pictures. You, yeah. Send it to us. Tag us Tag us on social media or send it to thedogmoms.com slash – sorry, dogtv.com slash thedogmoms. And we'd love to hear what you guys do yeah, with your pets for the holidays. Can, Dog TV can like share it on their Instagram and stuff. It'd be really fun to see some of our fans out there. And if you dress your dog up, even better bonus points for you. So yeah, that's what I, – I love the holidays. I'm really looking forward to it. And it always happens so quickly and it comes up so quickly. But, you know, this episode isn't just about the holidays. We have a big topic to talk about today. Yeah. And it's actually funny we're talking about it tied in with the holidays because I don't know about you guys, but I always get sick around the holidays. It's like prime time for people to get sick. And I'm like always getting a cold every time it's right going to be, you know, Are you getting a cold? Are you thinking you're getting a cold? I think so. I can hear it. It's like right there. I get it too. I get it too. It's just one of those things, but it looks so like, beautiful. Even oh, when you're getting a cold. She thank you. So you do pretty. too. <laughs> I'm not sick yet. I will be. I'm sure. I'll come hang don't, out at your don't house for a day. It. Don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that there's a. I don't know if you've heard about it. But there's a new canine virus going around. Yeah. And you know, it's not just holiday season, sick time for us, but there's like a new virus going around now as well for dogs, which is kind of mm-hmm. scary. And that's why I'm kind of really excited to talk to our guest today because I think that he'll be really informative for us to talk to a veterinarian about, you know, this new virus and like what we should do to keep our pets safe and, you know, make us feel a little bit more confident going into this holiday season and into this like sick weather season. A lot of people are planning on boarding their pets or they're traveling. Mm -hmm. And this is something that like some of those places are closing their doors. So it's how I feel. It's like, feels like it's kind of like a COVID for dogs. It's definitely not your typical kennel cough. So I'm definitely looking forward to talking to um, Dr. Courtney Campbell and see what he thinks, what we should do and all of the things so that we can feel prepared for the holidays. Now let's learn a little bit more about Dr. Campbell. Dr. Campbell is a highly respected expert in veterinary medicine known for his compassionate approach and extensive knowledge. He's appeared on numerous television shows and is a sought after speaker for his insights into animal health and well-being. And today he'll be sharing his expertise on a particularly timely topic. This is the canine respiratory 
illness that we're seeing throughout many dogs all across the U S it started at the West coast. Now it's here. And with the change in seasons and all the holiday gatherings, it's really important to know how to keep our furry family members safe and healthy, especially during this time of year. That's right. So if you guys have been wondering about your dog's cough or how to protect them from respiratory issues this holiday season, you're in for a treat. So say hello to Dr. Campbell. Well, Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for joining us. I know we are so excited to talk with you and we have a billion questions to ask you, but I know that there is a lot of reports about a mysterious illness, respiratory illness that's affecting a lot of dogs and a lot of people are asking about it. So would you just be able to give us an overview of what pet owners and what Chrissy and I should know about what this illness is and what to do about the situation? Well, there has been a a sharp uptick in both uh, the attention and the amount of media coverage regarding this respiratory illness in dogs. So I just want to start out by just thanking you guys for covering this and thank you guys for putting this front of mind for so many people because we know it is there are some deep concerns about this. So I appreciate and I've been looking forward to this all all weekend long. So uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right to dive right in there. There's a lot of things we need to think about, particularly with respiratory illnesses in dogs. And the, the first thing I, I, I contextualize this and I think about this in terms of where I, you know, where I live and where, where the region that I'm coming from, I recognize that there was an inertia a change in people's interactions with dogs, uh, I want to say maybe two or three years ago. And what I would see when I'd walk down the main street in Santa Barbara, California, I'd walk down main street and I would see people respond to French bulldogs as if they had never seen a dog before, right? (laughs) They were just so happy. They were overjoyed. They would say hi to the dog first before they would say hi to the human. And so when we talk about respiratory illnesses in dogs, You know, I contextualize it in this in the frame of who is the most at risk. Right. And when we talk about respiratory illnesses, we think about the young, we think about the old, but particularly in veterinary medicine, we think a lot about those who have a compromised respiratory system Mm. just by the way that they're born. And so all of those brachiocephalic dogs and the French bulldogs and English bulldogs, they certainly are front of mind, along with all the other breeds of dogs as well. So when we're talking about this quote unquote mystery illness in dogs, the reality is the reason why it seems so mysterious is because a lot of the things that we're seeing aren't behaving like a typical Mm. Uh, standard cases that we'll see throughout uh, throughout the year. For example, we don't actually have an idea on who exactly the enemy is, mm-hmm. right? When we think about infectious disease, we like to really get an idea on, you know, who is the enemy and how do they behave, right? And this enemy, typically, there's at least 12 different pathogens that typically cause respiratory illness in dogs. And right now we don't have a definitive answer Hmm. on whether it's one of the 12, whether it's a new case or something else. And we also are learning about the way this enemy behaves. Reportedly, there are increased cases of pneumonia and Hmm. increased and duration of this illness seems to be extended. So there's some things that we're trying to figure out, but no clear and definitive answers right off the bat. Uh, Are they calling this bacterial? Are they calling this viral? Are we not sure? That's an excellent, that's an excellent question because when we, when to answer that question, I think it just takes us a step. We need to take a step back or at least a half a step back and think about this acronym that you constantly hear, which is canine infectious respiratory disease complex. And that acronym or CIRDC signifies the fact that You know, when dogs have these respiratory illnesses, there are, like you said, or, you know, or like you're referencing over 12 different pathogens. Some of them are viral. Some of them are bacterial Mm -hmm. that can ultimately cause these, these signs. And the reality is. To answer your question more simply, we don't know whether Mm -hmm. this is viral or bacterial, uh, but there are some things that certainly we're thinking about saying, all right. We have four potential factors that I think influence the amount of attention that's coming at this, right? One is the disease factors, right? Is this a new bug? Is this bacterial? Is this viral? 
One is the group factors, right? How many dogs are together? Are there clusters of dogs together? Um, are there clusters of cases that we're seeing, but they just, you know, we get more media attention? The dog, right? Whether mm -hmm. old, young, or whether they're less vaccinated, or there's been some vaccine hesitancy that we've seen among families. And then finally, people, right? We, we, is there a situation where this is a, uh, a viral, this is a respiratory disease that because of social media or because of uh, national media or because some people are drawing more attention to it, we're actually putting more attention than we would typically do. Mm. Now, let me be clear. The amount of focus and the amount of concern and the amount of attention, I think it's warranted because people mm. love their dogs and we want to make sure every dog is safe. However, what we don't want to do is necessarily instill panic or right. um, unnecessary concern. Now, is this something that behaves like kennel cough or the flu, like that, you know, we vaccinate our dogs against? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, because when I hear the word kennel, when I hear the term kennel cough, a lot of people a lot of people have been using that term for, for decades, and it makes sense, right? You bring your dog to a kennel or boarding facility, they come out with a cough, and you're like, ah, just kennel cough. And typically, the main usual suspects for kennel cough has been Bordetella bronchoseptica, parainfluenza, adenovirus. But now we realize, and we're moving away from the term kennel cough just because we know that these dogs can get them anywhere, anywhere. Right? Oh, they anywhere. can get them at yeah. dog parks they and can different get them strains at, yeah different strains grooming salons the vet right. clinic mm -hmm. anywhere right so now we just call it canine cough or infectious disease cough and this is behaving like it in the sense of ocular discharge or discharge from the mm -hmm. eyes oh interesting discharge from the nose oh, wow. a soft cough but then what's happening which is why it's a little bit different is it seems that in some cases it's persisting for longer Mm, and we're yeah. seeing potentially higher amounts of pneumonia. Right, oh, wow. right. And it's it's yeah. not something that now if someone does come into, you know, the clinic or veterinary hospital with this, obviously, it, are we treating actively with antibiotics? Is it something that, you know, you have to obviously keep your pets away from other pets? Is this only dog to dog? Well, this is those are you listen, uh, all of those are amazing questions, but they're yeah. all there's a three amazing questions packed into to, into one. Number one, I 100 percent agree with that. That intimation is like, what are we treating with? How mm -hmm. do you treat that? And obviously, I think a good disclaimer is always follow the advice of your veterinarian. Right. Yeah. They're weighing some things that maybe you might not consider. For example, uh, when I when I mentioned that I saw this sort of takeover of breed so that Frenchies are now the number one breed in the nation. When I saw that wow. takeover, it's also important to remember that there are some uh, brachycephalic dogs or French bulldogs who may uh, be prone to regurgitation or vomiting. Right. So when you're so when you're prescribing antibiotics, you have to think, is this Best safe? You know, is it, is right. it, yeah, safe for the dog? And also, is it doing more good than mm -hmm. harm? If I'm prescribing antibiotics to all of yeah. these cases, mm -hmm. and every time they get the antibiotic, they start vomiting, that's right. not safe, right? And mm -hmm. so I think number one is to remember, always follow the advice of your vet. Number two, remember, antibiotics don't treat viruses, right? right? right. So if this is viral, it's then antibiotics... Anything. Yeah, may may not may not do anything, and so your your vet may look at one of those your your dog or one of these cases and say, "This is probably going to be one of the mild ones, right? This okay. is probably just going to be ocular, you know, out. high discharge, some yeah. sniffles, no antibiotics are needed, right?" Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, this is this is what I love about this podcast because I hear the sound of life in the background. It's, yes. it's, it's, <laughs> It my my little baby has a lot to ask you as well, apparently. Oh, yeah. Listen, <laughs> so, listen, so does my cat. Is my cat is wondering, actually, since my cat is here, um, he's wondering if you guys have seen if this is impacting cats as well. Is it just a dog virus? Is there any way that you know anything about that yet? Pretty pretty simple answer there. Not We have not seen any obvious evidence of cats. But here's what's <laughs> interesting about that. Some people are talking about 
And again, we don't have any data to support this. So, you know, this is why I think we need to approach these news items with caution is that they're seeing cases of dogs who have uh, incidents of pneumonia or longer course of infection in COVID positive people. Mm -hmm. And what I think would be really odd or unusual was that we know dogs do get infected from COVID, but they don't typically get sick from it, right? Mm. And if they do get sick from it, it's a super mild case. So then you talk about your cat and you say, well, we want to know if this is happening in cats. We know cats are actually more sensitive right. to, to COVID, right? And they actually do show more clinical signs than dogs That's do. Crazy. So I think as we start to learn more, and again, I think it would be absolutely extremely odd, unusual, atypical for this to have any association with COVID whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But if we do see that, uh, we'll be very concerned about cats as well. Yeah. My, is there... Oh, sorry. Go you can ahead. Go ahead no, go ahead, Amber. <laughs> go ahead. You're good. So I'm wondering, um, you know, because this is something that we've seen questions come in as well. Um, is this something... I know you guys are It's still learning about it. Is there something that like having your dog vaccinated against something could... I know a lot of people are wondering, like, is there a vaccine or if my dog has certain vaccines, are they protected? I know that's a question people are asking quite frequently. So if you have the danger of some sort of mystery dog illness that's circulating, the one thing you don't want your dog to get is one of the usual suspects of illness, Mm -hmm. right? You don't want your dog to get a co-infection. You don't want your dog to be sick and then come in contact with this so-called mm-hmm. mystery dog illness. So right. number one, I completely agree, certainly vaccinate your dog against the vaccinatable, right? Mm-hmm. Vaccinate your dog against the things that we know are out there. And that could potentially keep your dog free from either a co-infection, keep your dog free from having to go into the hospital, right, within a respiratory illness, And now they may be among other dogs who have respiratory Mm. illnesses, right? So it saves you as a a pet parent or as a family member. It saves your dog a hospital visit and it keeps your dog from possibly getting, you know, some sort of co-infection. That question, I think, is so important because it really gets to the heart of what this possibly could be. I think everybody's kind of nervous that this is some new agent. Mm -hmm. But what seems to be more likely is that this is a one of the usual suspects. This is something that we've seen before, it's a right? New strain. But yeah. it's just presenting in a different way. Now, a lot of people are worried about the holidays coming up and their travels. A lot of people are trying to board their dogs. A lot of people are actually getting into classes and trying to train their dogs or doing their natural, like, well, we go to the dog park or daycare. Right, or getting a holiday groom, you know, right? <laughs> is this something that you would suggest yeah. people maybe find other alternatives at the moment? And my second add-on to that is you may not know yet, but are we worried that this is like, you know, me walking my puppy, let's say in a grassy area by a pet store is a high risk or it has to be really like sneezed or droplets, like actively put on, you know, through close contact. Well, that's a great question because nothing is technically zero risk, right? Right. Everything carries a certain amount of risk. With him. And so if I have an elderly dog who or an elderly pug who's necessarily maybe on chemotherapy or an elderly pug who's on uh, who has severe allergies and are immunosuppressants. Well, now I've got a dog who's brachycephalic. That's already a risk factor. He's elderly. That's already a risk factor. And he's on meds for allergies, which suppresses the immune system. Mm -hmm. That's already a risk factor. That dog, to me, is a candidate that's at a higher risk and should you know, stay home with the family. And like you said, right. find other alternative. But let's say you've got a young strapping Weimaraner, fully vaccinated, mm-hmm. very active, otherwise healthy. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, this guy's not going to slow down until he's like maybe 17 years old. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So you just know that this is a, a strapping dog. That dog to me is, again, a low risk. Again, we, we want to emphasize nothing is zero risk, but I would weigh that those options with, with your dog, because I think one time that, you know, of course, the priority is health, right? Avoiding mm-hmm. infectious disease, avoiding infections, avoiding pneumonia and the health of other dogs. But one thing I, that we can't forget, particularly in the nature of this conversation, is dog's mental health, right? So if oh, you've got yeah, a dog who 
loves to go to the kennel, goes every day. And uh, all of a sudden now you're saying, nope, you can't go for weeks. You know, what does that do to that dog? How does that dog feel? Right. And how does that family feel having a dog who's bored in the house, who engages mm-hmm. in, you know, uh, damage or, you know, separation anxiety or those sorts of things? Uh, so th- we have to consider that. I'd say priority one, infectious disease, making sure they don't get sick. But then priority two is let's think about the mental health of these dogs who are on these schedules of, hey, right. listen, and, and to your point, Amber, I, I love the fact that you referenced uh, holiday grooming, because a lot of times I think that grooming can be considered as a luxury thing. But mm-hmm. for some dogs, grooming is an actual um, it, it 100 percent a necessity and essential mm-hmm. for their overall Absolutely. health and wellness. Yeah, in particular so breed. So I, I'm so glad that you you made that call. Up. Yeah, that yeah. call back to groomers. Yeah. I mean, and considering everything you just said. If someone is going to be boarding their dog for the holidays or they want to continue taking their dog to the dog park because it's their main source of exercise or they're getting a holiday groom, is there any type of precautions that people should be taking for their dogs that they would still be taking to those places? Yeah, I think this is key. I would really sort of talk to I, I would do these four four precautions because really what we're thinking about here is, all right. If we want to make sure that we're safe, right, we know that the environment has the invisible enemy. And Mm -hmm. if we know that if we know that there's an invisible enemy, what weapons do we have against the enemy? And the first weapon we have is limiting contact, especially transient contact with dogs of unknown health status. Mm -hmm. So let's say you go over your parents' house and you know your parents have a couple of dogs and they're otherwise healthy, well vaccinated. Well, yeah, that's fine. Like you definitely can do that. But let's say you see a dog who's, you know, at a dog park and you've never seen this dog before. You don't know what's going on with the dog. And you're like, well, I think those two would be friends. I'd love to introduce them. Pause for a second and say, do I know the health status of that particular dog, right? Mm -hmm. Again, you won't know the health status of every dog. It's hard to, right? But at the same time, that would be a classic scenario where you want to avoid transient contacts. Weapon number two, if you see a dog who's obviously sick, if you see a dog who obviously has nasal nasal discharge, ocular discharge, or you're hanging out with a bunch of dogs and you see one dog with this dry hacking or almost a goose honk cough, Mm. avoid those dogs, Mm -hmm. right? Keep your dogs away from sick dogs. Um, I would say... Uh, if weapon number four, three, this is kind of focusing on your own dog. If your dog is sick, if your dog has nasal discharge, if you wake up, you're ready to bring your dog for a walk. And as you're putting on the leash and collar, you notice that there's uh, a lot of, ex, you know, sort of discharge in the eyes and in the nose. Well, your dog actually shouldn't be around other dogs. Right. Mm-hmm, that's right. And then finally, just like you said, mentioned earlier, talk to your vet about vaccination. Right. Because we know that uh, some of these organisms, some of these bugs like Bordetella, they'll actually make dogs more susceptible to other viruses, Mm -hmm. meaning they will do damage to the respiratory tract that will make it easier for other viruses, uh, specifically parainfluenza, to colonize the respiratory tract, which is by definition a co-infection. So I'd say those are the four weapons. You know, limit your dog's contact. Keep your dog away from other dogs, um, sick dogs. Keep your sick dog away from other dogs. And then finally, make sure that you vaccinate. That's really helpful. Um, I know that this is a question that I've been wondering, and I know some other people I know have been wondering. If we have to take our dogs to the vet we have a healthy dog, but we know, oh, maybe there are sick dogs at the vet. Should we, sorry, Riley, also, my son has a lot to say on this question. Yeah. Yeah, um, everybody's involved. Everybody everybody's everybody wants to know. He wants to check on his brothers and sisters. Um, yeah. But is there something we should know about taking our dogs to the vet? Should, should we postpone visits? I, what do we do in that situation? Yeah. Now, there's certain essentials that absolutely need to happen when you're bringing your dog to the vet, particularly dogs who have severe ear infections, dogs who need a rabies vaccine, dogs who need uh, a variety of treatments that are essential to them. Now, 
the one thing to remember is that that's a pretty low risk environment. Just the amount of cleaning, yeah. the amount of ventilation, the, the health professionals that are part of that process, that's a pretty low risk environment. So you'd have to weigh that risk with your personal dog and then ultimately give your vet a call and say, hey, listen, my dog's due for uh, a nail trimming. Should I come in? Do you, you know, is, have you seen an uptick in pneumonia cases? And they might say, you know what? Let's postpone this nail trimming. Mm. But if your dog is due for blood work, to check for liver disease and how things are going, right. well, then, yeah, your dog may need right. uh, to come in for that liver disease. Right. So if there's something say, wrong, I guess you have to kind of outweigh, like, is this worth waiting to check on or something like that? Yeah, you, you, you absolutely nailed it right on the head. Everything is a sort of a cost-benefit analysis. Mm-hmm. And we do that all the time. We had a crash course of this during the pandemic where we weighed, does it make sense to go into these environments or should we just order food on a food delivery service, right? right? Should we just get door yes, So I we know. all had these sort of cost benefit analysis, right? Or what should, what should we do? And so um, I completely agree with what you're saying. And that is if you, if you, the vet clinic is going to be a low risk environment, but it is certainly not zero risk. So, you know, the media does make everyone want to head to the hills and uh, run because it sounds really scary. But it sounds like for you, you're also saying, you know, just have a good have your good wits about you. And if you have a dog that's going to be compromised, then make those decisions, you know, for that dog that may be older or, you know, be a pug or a Frenchie. Um, you know, but doesn't mean to cancel all your holiday plans. It also means that you can still do your normal activities, but try to mitigate, you know, what dogs you're coming across and maybe familiar dogs versus dogs that you don't know, and maybe decide a different activity than the dog park and, you know, sharing water bowls and things like that as well. All right. I like the way you put that. Keep your wits about you. Yeah. It almost sounds like a euphemism for have common sense, and I, yes, I completely yeah. agree I mean, with that because I think sometimes we, we 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 throw that out the window, particularly in crisis situations or emergency situations. And I totally understand that. I mean, we're all driven by the care and the love that we have for our species, different family members. But I do think exercising common sense makes complete sense, particularly around the holidays. You know, we, you know, they, they talk about, you know, for humans, they make sure you wash your hands. Mm-hmm. One thing I do think is important to remember is that so far, there's no information right now regarding fomites. And just for everybody okay. who, you know, who non, non uh, veterinary professional listeners, you know, it, it's, You know, fomites are defined as just inanimate objects that can spread infection, right? Mm -hmm. So like you said, a water bowl, a leash, a collar, a harness, anything like that. We don't know if any of the mystery bugs lives on those sort of things. But right now, what it looks like is this is all respiratory droplets. You need Mm -hmm. to have contact with another dog. If Let's say there's a dog who's coughing, right? And they were by this particular fence an hour ago and you walk by that fence with your dog, it's not saying that your dog's going to get pneumonia, right? Right, uh, right. But you just, if your dog had direct contact with that other dog, that's what it's certainly seeming like could right. be the, the way this infection is spread. Got so, it. So, um, you know, this is not, I think thin media makes us feel like this just happened, but I believe this has been around for a while, hasn't it? This isn't necessarily well, brand new. Yeah, Yeah, thank you for that. It just really depends on your definition of this. When you say this has been around a while, is this a new bug or is this one of the usual suspects? Because I heard Oregon was pretty inundated for a while. Like for a lot sure. Of the reality there. is Oregon, you know, their state uh, vet board has been uh, excellent about reporting cases. They've been vigilant about sur- uh, with their surveillance about what's been happening. But they absolutely had been seeing a slight uptick and a slight rise in cases uh, starting in the summertime. Right. Mm-hmm. And starting if you follow some of the graphs that have now been charted, uh, Oregon cases in particular, they've started to see a slight rise. But if you actually look at charts and data from across the country, what we've actually been noticing is there's been an uptick or a rise in the just the baseline level of dogs who have been reported to have cough and pneumonia. Yeah. Now that gets a little bit confounding because let's say a dog has a tracheal issue or windpipe yeah. issue or tracheal collapse and he gets presented for coughing and pneumonia. Well, that has nothing to do with this mystery illness, right? right. And so that can skew the data a little bit. 
But I think the reality is when you say this has been going on for a while, you're absolutely right on two fronts. Number one, the fact that the recognition of this in Oregon has been slowly increasing. And now okay. it's involving more states, including California, Texas, Virginia, Indiana, Illinois, uh, and, and Nevada. And But then the second front that you're also correct on is the baseline level of infection, the baseline level of pneumonia cases that we've seen uh, has slowly been increasing over the past year and a half. Sure, mm. sure, across the board. Right, across the board from all of these different pathogens. And the question is why, right? Are we seeing an, a greater incidence of just recognition? People are sort of focusing on that. Or is it the fact that, you know, over COVID, a lot of more dogs were adopted, right? And so yeah. a lot of people have That's a good more dogs. Point. It's a beautiful thing, right? That can raise uh, a statistic on its own. Just because yeah, exactly. that there's more dogs in people's homes, right? There you go. So that so just because of that, you know, if you have more dogs, then you might have more respiratory cases. Hmm. You know, let's say one or two percent of these cases are going to be severe, particularly in the case of canine influenza. And so, is it just this really tragic and depressing math problem where you have more dogs? So because you have more dogs, you have more cases, and because you have more cases, there's more severe cases. Or is this actually a problem with the bug? Is this a new bug that's causing more damage and doing, you know, weirder things that we're not accustomed to? Uh, I think the jury is still out on that. Interesting. Wow. That's something I never would have thought of. And I don't think anyone else would have thought of either. Right. Yeah, that's right. Well, it definitely, it definitely I, I sheds will- some light on the situation. Well, it sheds a light on not only the fact that there's a concern, but then all of a sudden, as we start to dig deeper, we start to realize that, the, you know, the field of epidemiology or herd health and population health, it starts to get pretty complicated very quickly. And just yeah. as an aside, I think one of the hardest classes that I ever had in in, in college was certainly statistics and biostatistics oh, and yes. looking at, statistics. you know, popul- yeah, it was just like, OK, <laughs> now I see why this is helpful. <laughs> but in situations like these, it can be really helpful. I'm just g- glad I'm not the guy to crunch the numbers. Right. You know? That's oh, right. Oh, that's now, in your practice, have you actually witnessed any cases? Fortunately, no. I, okay. We just haven't. Now, obviously, you say, well, Courtney, you know, we know that you're a surgeon. You know, why would you care about a mystery illness or a dog cough? And the reality is, uh, you know, not again, not to pick on Frenchies, but I remember, you know, Frenchies have a predilection for elbow fractures when they're puppies, meaning they jump off couches and break their elbows. Mm-hmm. And when you have an elbow fracture in a puppy, that needs to be fixed immediately. Like sometimes people joke and say it should have been fixed yesterday because we know that when you have a bad elbow fracture, things can uh, things can go badly quickly in that joint. But if you have a friend who comes in, he has an elbow fracture, he hasn't been vaccinated and he's mm. coughing. Oh, I can't geez. touch that particular mm. fracture. I can't treat that dog. So I think regardless of your discipline, whether you're a surgeon, an internal medicine specialist, whether you're an oncologist who focuses on cancer, whether you're a dog trainer, a groomer, boarding a kenneling facility, infectious disease affects us all. Right. Infectious disease is something all of us should be concerned about, uh, regardless of your particular your particular discipline. In my practice, fortunately, I haven't seen an uptake in pneumonia cases, thank goodness. Yeah. But the question becomes, you know, is it coming? You know? Right now, right. to end, you know, my thought for that is, is you mentioned like dog groomers, dog trainers, all of us, is there any sanitary practice that you can recommend that would be just something that, you know, cause if I'm sending my dog to a dog training facility, if I'm going to go to a dog training facility, it's not just like, well, let me keep my common sense or what's about me. It's also like, it's, I hope it's the responsibility of that business to try to sanitize and do what they can do to help keep their place clean. And I'm guessing, you know, there's only so much you can do at this point. Right. Yeah, no, there's, you're, you're exactly right. And the, the strategies for preventing infectious disease probably beyond the scope of our conversation today, because we could probably talk for hours, if not semesters about how to, you know, control infection. But I would say as sort of a, 
um, a quick, very high level uh, analysis of that is number one, cleaning is different than disinfection, right? Oh, cleaning right. Remo- means yes. removing all organic material, right? You can't just spray the disinfectant on organic material and expect it to, you know, uh, to expect it to do its job. And what we're talking about when we say organic material is anything that comes out of dogs, right? Anything, yeah. any sort yes. of um, a secretions, materials that are coming out of a dog is defined as organic material. And so um, certainly you want to remove that physically and then disinfect. And disinfect it, just simply read the bottle, right? If you have, let's say, I'll pick on uh, accelerated hydrogen peroxide and it says you need a contact time of one to two minutes. Well, you can't just spray it and wipe it off, right? You got to do that three minutes. So number one, clean. Number two, uh, disinfect. Number three, those places where you're bringing your dog, I think are going to have outstanding ventilation. At least I mm-hmm. hope so. Mm-hmm. And then finally, the last is uh, the protocols of intake. Sometimes mm-hmm. they'll have groups right. where they go all in and all out intake rather than mixing dogs who have been there for a while or new dogs. So clean, disinfect, ventilation, and all in, all out strategies, I think are just a very high level way of uh, taking a look at how do we keep our dog safe in these right. boarding and facilities? Yeah, and to add to that, I wanted to ask, I know we had some questions from our audience, and one of the questions that I saw that kept coming up, is there something that um, we as pet owners can do with our dogs, either at home or any ways that like we can be, take precautions to help keep our dogs safe, not just at boarding kennels, but I know a lot of people are asking about taking their dogs on walks, but they are curious if you have suggestions of things they can do to help keep their dogs, uh, preventing them from getting this illness. You know, honestly, the the reality is I think people are doing an outstanding job already. There Mm -hmm. isn't anything necessarily beyond those four strategies that we talked about already. Just watching out for your dog to be sick, watching out for other sick dogs, watching out for transient contact of dogs of unknown health status and making sure that your dog is well vaccinated against the usual suspects. I think those four are the biggest four things that you can do as, you know, a pet owner, or fam- you know, for your, for your family member and just keep them safe. Now, there's nothing that you should be giving your dog to sort of, you know, strengthen their immune system right. or there's no supplement or anything like that. Um, the, as far as cleaning and, and disinfection is concerned, again, so far, everything looks like it's respiratory or direct mm-hmm. contact through nasal secre- or respiratory secretions. Uh, but You know, when we get more information, if it means that we need to start disinfecting our objects, you know, uh, those are key. Also, avoiding communal water bowls would be a great idea, too. Uh, We know that that's a a hotbed of Mm. of infection as well as parasites and a bunch of other things. But uh, those would be the things that I would avoid. Well, that's super informative. And I think that you've like covered every you've single covered base everything. that we can think of. That's, yes. I, I definitely feel more comfortable because, you know, you're sitting here thinking like, should I not go on walks with my dog? Should I not go to the park mm-hmm. with my dog? But, you know, I think in general, like what I can take from what you've told us is that, you know, take precautions. But if your dog is a generally healthy dog, just like, you know, be smart, keep your wits about you. Like Chrissy said, That's right. um, look out for sick dogs and then, you know, be a responsible pet owner. And if you're noticing signs, like you said, ocular discharge or nasal discharge or coughing, um, first thing to do would be to call your vet, right? So that's that's the number one person that everyone who is a pet owner should be talking to yes, is their vet l- with concerns. Let your vet know before you walk through the door that right? you have a dog <laughs> that's coughing. I used to work at a vet and um, that was always one thing. They walked in and be like, so my dog's coughing and all the over the place right? <laughs> in the waiting room. And I'm like, no. Yeah. yeah. It, it, <laughs> that, you know, both of you summarized it so well. There's been all sorts of controversies about, you know, when, when is this, you know, where is this coming from and what what's causing this? Is it one of the usual suspects like Mike? Mycoplasma, mm-hmm. um, you know, should, which antibiotics should we be using? And by far, my still my top choice, despite all the controversy, is going to be doxycycline. It's one of those low level antibiotics, has good penetration. Uh, it treats, you know, potentially mycoplasma if this turns out to be the case. And uh, like you said, as far as just should you be able to take your dog out for a walk? It's all about risk benefit scenario, right? Mm-hmm. And so I completely agree with you. Nothing is zero risk, but if your dog is young, healthy, and vaccinated, then you should feel comfortable that your dog's in that in that cohort, is in that population of low risk dogs. 
Yeah, that's great. I feel I feel more at ease. So I, I really appreciate you I giving know. us all this information for sure. It's so well, true. I, I really enjoyed being here and just thank you so much for inviting me to this. Oh gosh, thank you for coming on. And I know our listeners are going to absolutely love this episode. And I feel like you answered everyone's questions. Um you just know, with in this time. crazy thing going just on. I know. Because no, everyone's it's... about to ship off to holidays. And I know boarding yes. facilities are wondering. And this is like crunch yeah. time in a lot of different ways. And I think that, you know, I think if we all just take a deep breath and just, you know, really plan it out and make those smart choices and don't be impulsive about our choices with our dogs, right. that we can we can definitely kind of bypass some of these illnesses that we're seeing. Chrissy, I'm so glad you mentioned the word holidays because what you've done implicitly is you put a timestamp on this. And that's all I can say. That's my only final ad is this is what we know as of this date, right? right. 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 You know, if we find out something later, that doesn't necessarily mean we're wrong. It just means we're learning more information. That's uh, one thing I really want to emphasize is that uh, if you hear something and then you might hear something different a few weeks later, that doesn't you just we're learning more. So right. thank you so sure. much for putting that de facto timestamp on it. And if uh, we learn more, I'd love to do a round two with you so yeah. we can talk about it some more. Yeah, that yeah, would be that's, wonderful. That's such a great point for everyone to remember is that like with new information coming out, it doesn't mean anything that you said is not is not truth and it's not something to keep in mind because we're learning more about this. And I'm sure we'll continue to learn more about it. And we'll, of course, have you back to talk more oh, about yes. it if we continue so to much. learn more. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Oh, thank thank you. you so much for coming on. And I well, have a happy holiday too. Yes. <laughs> happy holidays to everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Well, as our episode comes to a close, we'd like to extend a huge, huge thank you to Dr. Courtney Campbell for joining us today and shedding light on this important topic. Your insights and advice have been incredibly valuable, especially in these uncertain times. And I know I feel a lot more comfortable with all this information when coming into the holiday season. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Campbell, thank you. Thank you for helping us and our pets. And to our listeners, we hope this episode has been informative and helps keep your dog safe and healthy and helps you while you're planning your holiday travels and fun. That's right. And with that, we also want to wish you all a very merry, happy holiday season. May it be filled with joy, peace, and plenty of tail wags and kisses. Remember to keep an eye on your pups and keep them close and safe during these all these festivities. Yes, enjoy this wonderful time with your loved ones, both two-legged and four-legged. Thank you all for tuning in to the Dog Moms Podcast. Be sure to join us again for more discussions, tips, and stories that celebrate our life with our dogs in 2024. And until then, check us out on social or dogtv.com forward slash the dog moms. Stay safe, stay well, and as always, keep loving those puppies. Have happy holiday, everybody. Yes, happy holidays and goodbye for now. And remember, keep those tails wagging. Bye. Bye. Dog box, dog box, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Dog box.